the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is <clears throat> Every time we read the Holy Scriptures, we discover another facet, another angle, another way of understanding something about God and about faith and about repentance and about the spiritual life. We learn this from the Lord's encounters with each individual in the Gospels, whether men or women, rich or poor, sick or those who are well, the virtuous, the sinner, there are no accidental characters in the Gospels. And if we place ourselves in the shoes of a disciple, a learner, a follower, we find that there is something for us to learn about the faith and repentance of each person that has encountered God face to face. The Church preserves such examples for us in her prayers. All the prayers of the Church are deeply rooted in the Scriptures, by the way. And this is especially true of the prayers we read in preparation for Holy Communion. Many of you know these prayers, but sometimes these treasures can be hidden in books that many find not very accessible. There's a service of preparation for Holy Communion. In Greek, it is called metalipsis. In Arabic, it wasn't translated, so we say matalipsi. The word means sharing in or partaking of, and that's a reference to, Holy, to the Holy Eucharist. In English, the service is written as the service of preparation for Holy Communion. The service includes prayers that we can say the night before we are going to be approaching Holy Communion. And there are some prayers to be said in the morning, and there are some prayers even that are said right before we receive Communion. One of these prayers is, I believe, O oh Lord, and I confess, which you hear every single week, every time we celebrate the liturgy. Today I've asked our chanters to say the one also that comes before it in the, in the service. You will hear them pray, I stand before the gates of your temple. And this prayer makes reference to the Canaanite woman that we uh, read about this morning. In these prayers, the saints recall how the Lord always accepts those who had come to him in repentance. People like the thief on the cross, the publican, the prodigal son, the sinful woman, the woman with the issue of blood, and also the Canaanite woman. Today we're going to unpack the encounter of the Canaanite woman with the Lord, which can strike us as a bit uncharacteristic of the Lord. The Lord seems to be harsh and insulting. You know, atheists love the story. They love to point out how Jesus was unacceptably rude to this poor woman. Of course, you can make up all kinds of things when you read the scriptures out of context. We also love the story, not for the same reasons. Obviously, we love the story because of what it reveals to us about faith and about humility. The Lord encounters this woman when he was in the region of Tyre and Sidon. Today, these are areas in the south of Lebanon, Said al Sur. This region is not part of Judea, it's adjacent to Judea. The people in Tyre and Sidon are Phoenicians. They worshiped pagan idols and practiced the pagan religion. 
when we encounter this in the scriptures, we shouldn't think of the relations between pagans and Jews, and later between pagans and early Christians, with the same lens that we would look at today for religious pluralism or interfaith dialogue. This is not the kind of thing that is going on. The perception is very different. This is not just a different culture. Pagan religion included highly immoral behavior as part of its core worship and practices. And that's why Jews and early Christians kept a distance and avoided relations with the Gentiles. In fact, today we are celebrating the memory of uh, Saint Elian. I spoke about him yesterday uh, after Vespers. We read about him uh, at Matins. If you want an example of what those Gentile early Christian relations were like, read his life. His pagan father was responsible for the tortures and martyrdom of this great saint. So this is not interfaith dialogue or interfaith relationships that we are thinking of when we encounter these episodes in the Gospels. Now in pagan regions like Tyre and Sidon that were close or in proximity to Judea, you could find people who are known as proselytes. These are people who, because of their encounters with the Jews, had left pagan religion and begun to appreciate the faith of Abraham. But these were not sons of Abraham, and so there was no room for them in the house of Israel. This is the context of the encounter today. This Canaanite woman was such a proselyte. That's why when she encounters Jesus, she addresses him as Lord and son of David. We heard a similar call from a blind man two weeks ago. These are Judaic words. These are the words of someone who recognizes that she is in the presence of the Messiah. And she's asking him for mercy because her daughter is demon possessed. In her words, she says her daughter is severely possessed by a demon. The fathers understood the daughter to be a type of the Gentiles and that what is happening in this gospel, in this encounter, is the beginning of the grafting of the Gentiles into the church. At first, the Lord does not answer the woman, and she continues to cry louder and louder. And at that point, his response is quite harsh. The fathers tell us there are two things going on here. First, by saying to her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Lord is making sure that his own people, the Jews, to whom he cared for very deeply, do not lose their salvation. You see, right before this passage, right before the Lord went to Sidon and Tyre, the Lord had just told the Jews and the Pharisees that had come to him, he told them that they needed to be released from the laws and the traditions of men, especially the laws related to food, which at that point were no longer serving their purpose. And they were actually keeping them away from a true encounter with God. The Pharisees obviously did not like that kind of preaching. And the Lord didn't want them to use his encounter with the Canaanite woman, with a Gentile, as a pretext to lead the Jews astray. The second thing going on, and a more important thing, is that the Lord already knew what is in the heart of this woman. 
and he wanted to highlight her faith to those around. St. John Chrysostom assures us of that, and he says, if he had not meant to give, that means if he didn't men, mean to give her what she had requested, neither would he have given afterward. So let us briefly examine the faith of this woman together. First, we see her tenacity, her persistence. When there are attempts to silence or dismiss her, she repeats her plea even louder. Most of us would have given up. Most of us, when we pray, we hope or expect some results, and when we don't see those results, we stop. We don't bother anymore. Next, there is her humility. The Lord calls the Jews his sheep, and he's effectively telling her she's not one of them. In response, she kneels before him. He then no longer calls them sheep, but children, and her, he calls a dog. And here we see her humility. She frames her reply from his own words. She calls herself a dog and even elevates the children and calls them masters. It's because of her humility and her persistence that the Lord said to her, O woman, great is your faith. And the Lord always connects healing with faith. And he says, be it done for you as you desire. We need to hear this. Great faith is founded on humility. Without humility, there is no genuine faith, and our prayers are fruitless. If we wonder why we don't observe results, this is where we need to look our own lack of humility. We need to hear this when examining our own lives and our faith, not when judging the faith of others. Humility is the crown of the spiritual life and the key to acquiring any virtue. As we see in the case of this Canaanite woman, acquiring humility requires that we let go of our self-love. This is really important. It's something that we need to hear, especially today, because we are bombarded with self-empowerment messages that keep telling us to love ourselves, that we are perfectly great just as we are, that we don't read repentance, But once we begin to recognize that self-love is the primary obstacle to our spiritual life, all of that changes. And then we begin to desire nothing more than to acquire this crown of virtues that make true prayer possible. May the Lord grant this to us through the prayers of His Most Pure Mother and of all the saints.